Hello, Tom Levecki here <clears throat> with, my allergies are killing me, with the latest edition of the Arm Chair NBA. Today, we have a very special guest. He's in the green room as we speak. Um, I'll get to him in a second. has written over 20-something books from the Bronx. A great Italian-American, great Italian-American author, businessman. This is not one to miss. Tom Levesque here with the latest edition of the Armchair NBA. Just a quick update on the Armchair store. Thank you, RJ Roger. My wife hates me. T-shirts are in. Please buy them if it fits, which for many of us it does these days, at the armchairmbastore.com. We'll put the link below. Today, we got a very special guest, Louis Romano, author of 21 books, best-selling author, lives in New Jersey, smokes cigars, is Italian, the trifecta. <laughs> Louis Romano, welcome and to I have, and I have the al- And I, have this, I share the allergies with you, Tom. It's part of living in New Jersey, I think. It's a, it, it's a, it's a rough year. So, all right. Yeah. So, okay, so if you're in New Jersey, this is historically, right? There's two ways you kind of made money. You worked in pharmaceuticals like I did, or you worked in oil, right? Like Lewis yeah. did. So Lewis, give us a little background. I think you're from the Bronx. Give us like your formative years, and then we'll kind of work work our, our way along. Well, yeah, I went to St. Raymond's High School in the Bronx. I survived that after I survived the nuns, which is, you know, I, I, I'm sorry. What I, I don't want to say what I call them, and I'm not going to. I'm going to be a gentleman. Um, so after college, I, I got into a few sales jobs and finally wound up uh, working for Hess. Amarada Hess Corporation, you know, down in Woodbridge, they had that yep, big building. Yep. So I, I, I worked my way up uh, at, to a, sa- a sales management position. Really? Uh, they didn't want me because I was Italian. I was short and I was from the Bronx. Mm. So after 14 years, they were all working for me and I loved it. Love it. I was pirated by another company, which was owned by Italian Americans in uh, Westchester, Castle Oil. I was senior VP there. Oh, lots wow. of money, lots of opportunity great family until the uh young people came in and knew everything and i decided to take my uh ball and jacks and start my own business which i did Wait, hold um, on really quick really quick because i want to unpack that really quick so yeah. first of all not far off because lou's still alive and kicking as far as i know uh, italian americans in corporate were not getting a fair deal up until no. the 90s and i can attest to that so number one congratulations on that number two yeah, yeah. Not, 50%, I think it might be higher. Maybe, I don't want to say higher, but at least 50% of second generation businesses fail. So whether you're inheriting a business oh, yeah. or you're working for a second generation business, caveat emptor, because there's a good chance they may not run well or may go under. Keep going, Liz. Sorry, I just want to unpack that a little bit. Third generation uh, family owned business, only 4% survive. Yes, you're right. That's where the 95% came from. Exactly, from exactly. Company. So, so um, you're right. Coming, I remember going into meetings at Hess, and the guy would say, "Oh, the mafia is here." Yeah, I, I mean it. I mean, this is back in the in the uh, in the '80s and the '70s. Actually, uh, I started there in '79, and I, it, it was it was just a different world. I, you know, I had this Bronx accent. I wasn't from Central New Jersey, yeah. although Leon Hess, who I who I knew fairly well oh, wow. uh, was a great guy he didn't look at things like that he was jewish uh he didn't look at things like that he embraced me uh the fact that i was chubby and short it didn't bother him but it bothered some of those vps from the south did he, did he have the jets yet or no yeah oh yeah i used to go with my kids i have three sons i used to take my kids to the to the practice field and uh, oh, wow. out, out in Hofstra, my kids grew up with the Jets. I mean, wow. in the lo- in the locker rooms, I used to go on on every Sunday to the Jet Giant games at the stadium. You know, suit and tie was great. Met everybody. My my, uh, my condolences about the Jets, but anyway. Yeah, my oldest son Lou, uh, he he he's still a Jets fan, and he blames me for it because <laughs> you know he, he was immersed in the Jet organization because Leon was so uh, was so nice to me about taking clients out there and entertaining them and going to the corporate box and stuff. We had a ball. I mean, uh, the kids had more of a ball than I did because Sunday was a work day for me, but uh, it was fun. It was, it was a good experience. Uh, I could have nothing bad to say about Leon Hess and uh, he was just a great man. Uh, Some of the people under him were not so great, but that's all right. Uh, But then I did okay after that and I did okay after that and I'm doing okay now. So uh, yeah, yeah. 
I decided to start after my uh, my business career was over. I was 58. It wasn't over. I still had a couple of companies I was involved with. Still am. Uh, but I uh, decided to start writing. I wrote my first book, which I didn't think was good. Uh, I don't even talk about it too much because I still don't think it's good. But uh, it got a lot of attention and people liked it. So I wrote another book about the Albanian mafia and the Italian mob in the city in the Bronx. That got a lot of attention. We got this close to making a movie out of it. Wow. Um, yeah. And then the third book I wrote, uh, Intercession, about a, um, a serial killer. And there was some personal reasons why I wrote the book, Serial Killer. When I get to know you better, I'll explain them. But we'll um, discuss it over cigars. Yeah, we will. So that and that's a time we should talk about it, Tom. So so um, that became a series of six books. Uh, the first book called Fish Farm became a series of six books. Uh, and I have some other books here and there. One very interesting one is about the Sicilians. I don't know your last your last name could be anything. Uh, I am I am uh, my family's from Napoli, but I had the pleasure of visiting Sicily three times, and I've oh. been to very. Um, how can I say very prominent cities there that have relationships with here in the U S I understand. I I'm from, my family is from near Palermo. Um, but I wrote which, a book, uh, which, which city, which town we're from La Cata Fried there. Uh, that's, that's where Lucky Luciano is from. How did you know that? I've been there. What? Yeah. Wow. Look at you. I'm, I'm, you're the first person that knew that. Yep. Not only was Lucky Luciano that was from me, but there was a Sinatra family. Correct, correct. Yeah, and I yeah. we knew them. We knew and all I've been there. So, so what happened was, um, I went to Sicily um, with my best friend. Still, my best friend's birthday is actually tomorrow. Happy birthday, Dom! Um, and uh, we went there with his cousin. And I said, "We got to go to La Cata Fridi. La Cata Fridi. Is it La Cata? Yeah, you said it right. La Cata Fridi. Yeah. It's been a minute, and." Um, and he's like, why? I'm like, that's like Luciano's hometown. And they're looking at me like yeah. I got 10 heads. Because you know you know this. They look at the mob categorically different than like we do here, right? Yes, like, yes. Like, like respectfully, we're looking at it like, ah, short of a movie star. They look at it as a person who has like their hand in your pocket. So he was like a little 100%. Like, thrown back. But nevertheless, we went there. And sure enough, the people could care less. We're like, oh, Guala Casa. And they're like looking at me like, we don't really, like, we don't celebrate it. Like, we don't, they're like, nobody no. would even show us the house. I, you know, I spoke to his great, great nephew oh, about wow. a month ago uh, in the town, uh, the way we're talking now. Yeah. And um, I wanted to do a book about when he was, he left there when he was eight or nine years old. He was old. young, yeah. And I wanted to do a book about how he became a mobster how he became the most famous guy in mafia correct, history. Correct, correct. I wanted to know what his formative years were like. Yes. And not that they didn't want to tell me, but they couldn't because everybody's gone. They're all dead. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he didn't know much about him otherwise, other than some photographs. I understand, that he though. I understand he wasn't from a mobbed up family. I understand. No, no, he wasn't. My family knew his family. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't. Actually, his father was a Carusi. Now, let, let me explain that. I wrote a book called Carusi. Okay. I went. I went to Lakata for to spend two weeks there. Oh wow! To do, yeah, to do research on the sulfur mines. Yes, and that's I will get, it smells over there. Yeah, it really does. I will give you the book when I see you. Please. Um, it's called Carusi: The Shame of Sicily, and the young boys in Western Sicily and in Lakata Frida, there's mines. They were forced to become like indentured servants, slaves. Yeah in the mines and it's horrific, but I turn it sort of into a love story a little bit. So it's oh, not wow. such a heinous story, but those kids, those kids really suffered oh, and wow. died. Yeah. Yeah. So now it, my, yeah. my, my, my anecdotal research, right? So when you, I have this thing, it's kind of like my Italian geography, kind of like Jewish geography. If you tell me where your family landed in the U S or like first lived, I can guess almost back to the hometown, right? No kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, for example, if you are from Elizabeth, New Jersey, you are most likely from Malata, which is where we're from, or from Ribera, which is Sicily. So, either Valadez or Riberese. If you are from wow. Newark and you are from Calabria, 
you are probably from the, the um, province of Catanzaro, and many people are from Spielinga. So, like, you could almost... Spielinga. Yeah, Spielinga, yeah. You could actually trace back. Um, yeah. Uh, 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 Bronx and Brooklyn are very heavily Sicilian, and Queens, for example. Queens has a lot of people from Borgetto, from uh, Toretta, from um, those kind of, those area to Paratinico. Wow, that's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. That's fabulous. Yeah, I know. I know some people in Jersey. A lot of them are bares. Uh, a lot of bares in Jersey. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. That's interesting. I've I've made a study of of being Italian American. Yeah. I just wow. read a great. I just read a great book, Tom. I would recommend it. Uh, it's about Sicily and the and the Sicilian Vespers. Uh, it's called uh, Siciliana, and it talks about Sperlinga and places like that. Where they were killing how, and how they killed the French yeah. to get them to get them out of there. Fascinating story. That that's that's what I love about. So, so I always argue with my buddy. So I got a little baby background noise. Um, I kind of argue with my buddy a little bit. Like I like to go to Italy. I've been there twelve times. Yeah, me I too. I go twelve more, God willing, right? Versus going to France here or there, because I think with Italy, with every corner you turn, there's still so much to see, especially Sicily. Absolutely. Italy. You got Absolutely. beautiful capo, you got beautiful beaches, you got Palermo, which it just has a certain there's a Palermo's vibe. A little, Palermo's a little grimy, but but it's nevertheless it 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 has a certain charm to it. A certain, there's a vibe. There's a vibe. Yeah, yeah. The, the people are duro. They're they're hard, but they're good people. You, you know what I mean? The foods yeah. are phenomenal. The cultures are phenomenal. So phenomenal. I love that. Um, I love that you continue to you know celebrate the culture. Live the culture. Just want to show some of the books that you have written. Some that you mentioned already. Oh, thank you. That's it's so nice. Curve, anxiety's curve, anxiety's nest. So look, this looks like more of your ones you mentioned earlier. Earlier, yeah. We'll, we'll deep dive a little bit with Gene in a minute. I see the Carusi, and then the Besa, and then the uh, other stuff. Obviously, um, um, a, a Light's book, and then yeah. some other great books as well. Uh, talk a little bit about the. Um, okay, so so I have like um, a thought. I, 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 I'm kind of fascinated a little bit by the Albanian culture, and here, here's why. Um, what what is their they have like a code, code of honor, right? And yeah, uh, it's called the it's it's called the uh, canon. And then and then and then and, and and there's like kind of rules that they have to live by. Yeah, it's the canon. It's the canon okay. of Luca Denigeni. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. I've read I've read it three times. It's a big volume. Uh, it, it it's their code of behavior. Okay. That super that supersedes any governmental uh, authority or any church authority. This is their culture. What are and some of the, What are some of the tenets of that, Lewis? If you don't mind. Well, honor. Uh, yeah. What's called the Bessa is their word of honor. Yes. Uh, the be Bessa is. Uh, let me give you a quick example of Bessa. Yeah. A woman, uh, a man knocks on the woman's door and says, "Can you please hide me? The police are chasing me." And he hides. She hides him. She gives him protection in her home. Hides him under the mattress. And the cops come in and say. Have you seen a young man running here? No. Well, he just shot your son and killed him three blocks from here. Wow. No, I haven't seen him. Wow. Because she gave her word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. Pretty good story, but it's factual. Uh, they wow. they give their word, and you're under their protection. Uh, but they also have a thing called hakmadia or jakmadia, and that, that is that that is their vendetta. Like you know, the Sicilians have the blood vendetta. Correct. But but with, with with the Albanians, it goes a lot deeper. And it goes for generations, generations. Uh, yeah. I I have a friend who was, uh, uh, and it's a blood it's a bloodletting. You have to you have to take back blood, which is what that word means. I have a friend who, in 1951, his father was killed in a skirmish in Albania, and uh, later on in that day, well, first he killed he killed the the captain of the other side. Later that day, after they took a break and they went back to fighting. He was killed, but my friend is 60, well, he's 75 years old. And when he goes back to Albania, he has to have all of his cousins protect him because he's still under the Hakmadia from that family. They're still looking to kill him. And that was uh, 70 years ago. It's a little bit different, but uh, they're wonderful people. People always say the Albanians are crazy. They're not crazy. Yeah. They're just very, very different. Um, and they're very aggressive, and they're very smart people. I have a lot of Albanian friends. God bless. So, okay, so you grew up in the Bronx. You yeah. Know, successful career. 
Um, one thing I, I like about your trajectory is you did work for somebody for a while before you worked for yourself. Because yeah. I have people all the time. I have people all the time that come to me and they're like, well, I want to start my own business. And I'm like, well, you make 170 grand a year. Make money. Do do your side hustle on the, t on the side if you love doing it. Right. Make right. 170. Do it for 20 years. Put money away. So when you when you go to start your business, you got 300 k to lose. You, you know what I mean? Like, right. So I like the fact that you were able to kind of I call it an entrepreneurship where it's internal, less risk, less yes. reward. You know, you didn't make seven figures maybe per year per se, but you grind it out brick by brick. You put some shekels together, and then you strike, which I love, and then that's. That's um, really redeemable, which I like. So, you know, writing's a passion of love. You know, do you, you self-publish? Are you hooked up with a publishing house? Do you shop them around? Go through your, your writing process. Well, I started looking at uh, publishing companies 15, 18 years, well, 15 years ago. Yeah. And I found them all to be either con artists or... <laughs> uh, so, so what I did was I started my own publishing company. And That's uh... Vecchia Publishing. Vecchia Publishing? Yeah, that's the name of it. Yeah. Jesus Christ, I can't right now. All right. We we are kindred spirits. So I don't talk about it a lot. Um, I'm a best-selling author as well. Two editions of the X Factor Selling System. Wow. After I did the first book through a vanity press, what did I do? I created my own publishing house. And there it is, the name of my company. I am self truly not only self-published, but um created my own publishing house. I did it through uh what was it? Um, uh, Ingram. Yeah, we're on Ingram. We can get yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm on all that. I, I, I use Book Baby now. I find Book yeah, Baby. Book Baby really is good. Book ba see, it's a different. See, I love that the barriers to entry. So, so, so for those watching, and Lou, I, I won't speak out of school. I'll have you correct me. But if Lewis wants, he goes to a big company. He goes, hey, I'm going to write a book. Maybe they'll throw him like 25 grand. He doesn't own the rights to it. He just let an employee. Right. He gets it over like eight months. And then, like, they create some nonsense when it sells well. Well, we had marketing fees. I mean, why oh, yeah. like 20 Barnes and Noble? And, like, next thing you know, it's useless, right? Now, he can write his own book and publish his own book, probably make even the same money, but it's all his, but he owns the rights to it. It's all about the IP, it's all about owning the rights. And you get distribution like you could in Barnes and Noble and Amazon, which make up for 95% of all sales. So you don't need to go to the local bookstores anymore, although I love it. And you can get it through Ingram. It's so that's smart. Um, so, you know, to, to your point, Tom, my book Intercession is right now uh, in the first stages of being made into a um, a, a full a, a script, uh, a, a movie. Yeah, out in California. I talked to the guy two days ago. Uh, he sent me a very amazing outline, and the 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 script should be done in the next three four weeks. Oh, wow. uh, and he's going to try to sell that to. As, as a not only as a, a feature film, but potentially because of the other books, as a uh, series. So I couldn't get that if I had a. To your point, I couldn't get that if I had Joe Schmo, uh, uh, Simon and Schuster, because they would they would own the rights. Yeah. And just for the content creators out there, especially in the book space, um, don't be look at it like a portfolio. Um, we know this. There's not a lot of money in books. I think I on my side. No. I've been very lucky. I pushed it, and I had corporate clients and stuff. I sold 2,500 units of this, but like I think I still lost money, <laughs> Lewis. Yeah. Know, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Not money yeah. Um, but nevertheless, the play is to own the property, and then you can maybe option it. Now, for those that we have a lot of YouTubers now, people watching YouTube, that's because of the pandemic and people were home and they're getting into YouTube. But it's migrating back to Netflix, Hulu, etc. And those big houses have the money, and they're starving for content. So you yep. got a good book, a good uh, treatment, a good uh, a series idea. Now's the time to pitch it because there is actually a shortage of viable content, as you know. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. You know. So okay. So we'll, we'll, we cover a lot of the business end. Now let's get into like let's first talk about a light. Uh, uh, I've interviewed John about five or six times now. Uh, probably all the interviews have been north of a half million views. Whenever I have him on, it gets big numbers. Yeah, he um, does. We became you know friends over the years. I had a lot of pushback, and him and I sometimes had issues here and there. But um, nevertheless, he's a controversial figure, but he does bring numbers. So give us kind of the iterations on John's book, how it came about, and uh, you know how happy were how happy were you with the outcome. 
Well, I, to be honest with you, I like John a lot. He's a very yeah. interesting character. He has uh, he, the man could have been anything he wanted to be in life. Yeah. He's a very bright guy. He has a photographic memory. Um, he's Albanian also. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of the Albanians don't care for him because of being a so-called rat. Yeah. Um, uh, every time I'm with John, I have a great time. Yeah. Uh, my business dealings with him went a little sour because you can't do. John's a tough character. Yeah. And he wants everything his way, and that's okay. I yeah. I didn't I didn't write his book to make money. I really didn't. I did it more or less. He asked me to do it, and I said okay, fine. And we had a we had a deal which I I, I didn't get. Uh, but I'm not on I'm not on I'm not mad at him. I'm not unhappy yeah. with him. Um, the other book that is doing a lot better than John's book, and not because it's a better book. John's a little bit over. Um, uh, how can I say this? Uh, overexposed. You know, this well, is. Let his... me ask you a question. One, one of the challenges I have is, um, and, and there's a reason why I kind of migrated towards John. What happened was he came on the scene and I interviewed him. It did really well, right? And the guys are not a big fan of mine, right? And I've reached out to them multiple times and said, hey, yeah. guys, you know, you know how press works. I've, I've interviewed this guy and this is what I'm doing. Right. Would you like to send a representative or whatever? So obviously I wasn't big enough at the time for John Jr. to come on, or, or nor does he do a lot of press. Um, Angel's not a big fan of mine. Um, and then lastly, they sent maybe a, a, a representative over that wasn't part of the family. So that didn't have as much weight as having us alien. Right, right. So over the years, Alight made himself more available than the other side did. So yes. I, I didn't have – I didn't favor him – because it was favoritism, it was accessibility, right? So what I'll exactly. do is I'll give him the fact that he makes himself accessible, and he's good at like he's good at like hiding, you know, hiding. He's good at um, seeing rising stars, like yourself, right? Granted, you're you're you know, tenured, you're still a rising star, right? However, my experience has been with dealing with a lot of these guys is they tend to do business the way they did in the streets, and business yeah. is different. Absolutely, you know, it's a whole different world. Yeah. So uh, how well did that book do or how well is it doing? I, 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 you know what? I'm, I, I've been cut off from the sales, but I can tell you from what I see, it's not doing well. The okay. book that is doing well is the Barello Gene. book. Okay, that, question. So um, you hooked up with Gene Barello, and I understand you kind of had a connection with him. Walk us through your experience with Gene. Uh, well, I could tell you the first time Gene walked in, I met him at a, the cigar place in Fort Lee, where yeah, I occasionally nice go. Yeah, it's a nice play. I know. Uh, I know the owner fairly well. And, nice. and so anyway, um, we uh, he walks in, you know, and, I, and I'm from the genre of, you know, the old mob guys in the Bronx where I grew up. I knew them all. Yeah. Uh, my father, my grandfather knew them all. They were but they were always dressed natally. And, you know, who wore suits, who wore the same color outfits with the same shoes. Very dressed up guy. Well, this guy walks in and he's got a T-shirt built like a brick shit house. Excuse the French uh, shorts. And sneakers, and I'm like, okay, this is Gene Barrell, and we sit down, and he and, he, and he's got Omerta tattooed on his arm, yeah. and I said to him, well, I guess you didn't listen too much to that <laughs> advice, did you? I did. I said it to him, Tom. I, I was like, you know, this guy could, you know, crush me in, in two, and and we both laughed, and he said, no, I guess I didn't, and that's what started the relationship off, and he's a He's a rapid talker. He's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, he has anger issues and he has yeah. to overcome those anger issues. Yep. Uh, and I've been trying to help him a little bit, but I'm not a psychologist. Yeah. Nor am I his dad, but I do help him from time to time. And um, his story is fascinating. Uh, if you're looking for murders, they're not in there. Yeah. But if you're looking for an everyday gangster and what they had to go through and the brutality of being in the mob, uh, yeah. and, and, and how bad it is on a day-to-day -day basis and what you have to do to keep yourself in money, eating. Correct, correct. Uh, the Borello book, uh, people love it. In spite of the issues that we have with the book itself, it's selling like crazy, man. Uh, you know, I, I think the last time I looked, it was like seven or 8,000 sales. and which Seven is or 8,000 copies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Holy and it, it, it's, it's, highly, it's highly ranked. Uh, it's been in the top hundred uh, for the past two weeks. I think it just went into one fifteen today, um, and and in that genre. Yeah. And uh, it, it's got a lot of. And, and Gene is always having me mail out books with his signatures in it. I mean, he it's 
he's great. The, the problem is that the life is not great. It's a treacherous life. Yep. And if the young people could read it and see it and know it's treacherous. And John Alight always discusses that with young people. And to his credit, he does that. Yeah. Um, he does give something back to the community. Uh, and I admire him very much for that. John's a brilliant guy. He really is. Well, well let, let me ask you. So, and I, I, I think you're one of the very few people qualified because you grew up in the Bronx. You're an Italian yeah. American. You're successful on the legitimate side. You probably respected access to some you know, illegitimate guys as well, but decided to go the right route. And I, I, I'm fascinated with kind of the business end. And I'll give you an example. So the Italian American Cosa Nostra is obviously on a steep decline, right? And I think the biggest reason is, and I get crap for this all the time, is they didn't they didn't keep up with the times and they didn't innovate, right? I right. would say I say it every show and I get abused for it. They should have recruited guys like you and me and said, listen, we're gonna make this more of a Freemasonry an Italian American brotherhood. And don't get me wrong, we keep our hands in the rackets. We right. we right. have right. listen, if you need listen, if you need something done, you let the consulier know we don't know anything and it happens. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like we like we have we live we live off our reputation. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, like yes. the Jewish gangsters, but emulate the society, create like a Freemasonry to the point that there's like one in every town, and it's called the Colombo Social Club. Freemasonry doesn't hide. Right. right? And, and, and build a unified Italian American business front that is actually infiltrates society, but in actually right. a different way. So why do you think the mob and then conversely? In Italy, the Calabrian mob is bigger than all of them. So, like, as yeah. the Americans declined, then we can't say it's the, the Italian esque culture because Italian Americans follow that culture. It's just the Italian Americans didn't adopt why the Calabrians did. So, give us your thought on that, Lou. Well, the Dragada is probably the most violent of the three organized yeah. crime units in Italy. Uh, they are they are steeped in, in violence and yeah. and and treachery. Uh, the Sicilians also steeped in, in violence and treachery, yeah. but but not so much uh, of late. In America, I think what we lost is the fact that uh, the RICO Act killed it. Yeah, it, you know, the RICO Act was something that just was was geared toward the organized crime, right. geared toward Italian Americans. Correct. And I, I'm going to tell you something. You may get mad at me, but rightfully so. They were going. No, around. no, no, I'm not. I, that's yeah. my. That's my point. Like, right. look, it, it, how many? Listen, I, I've lost, and I say, I, I say this every almost every day. I would rather go down to Ferrari Central Jersey, buy a new 430. I don't think they make the 430 anymore. Right. Buy it and push it into the Hudson River because that's how much I made in mistakes. That much dummy. I at least made four hundred thousand dollars in mistakes minimum <laughs> right minimum right but i was forced to pivot and i came out on top right we're all italian american we all deal with that adversity rico is just some big ass diversity that's why i think they should have said okay you know what we're going to be 20 percent illegitimate but we're going to be 80 percent legitimate corner the market on different businesses legally and then he can strive. So I'm agreeing with you, actually, on that. Right. One of the problems with Italian Americans is the word geluso, jealousy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you know that, right, Tom? Yeah. I mean, they're all jealous of each other. They have to do a big bagoda, bella fagoda. They have to go out and, and, and show and show and show. And let me tell you something. I had met Carlo Gambino as a boy. Oh, wow. The man walked into my uncle's restaurant, had a bowl of soup. You wouldn't know it was him versus the guy who did the, the cobbler, the yeah. shoemaker, three stores down. There was no show, no, nope. no show. So a friend of mine who just passed away a couple of years ago, he was a capo under Gotti and a dear man, I won't mention his name for his yeah. family's sake, but, but we were very, very close. And he said to me, you know, I'm in a restaurant with John Gotti and he's taking autographs. He's giving autographs. Mm. And he goes, in my day, if you had more than two drinks at the bar and the wise guy saw you and you were a mob guy, they yeah. clipped you. They yeah. clipped you because you were going to talk. Yeah. That's the whole difference between... They did that as a secret to to Bruno. Uh, uh, right. Got a few drinks and talk to uh, some wrong people there. Right. So you, 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 from a secret society, 
they became this Time Magazine uh, yeah. thing, and it, it just it just doesn't work for them, and it, it, it destroyed it as it is. Well, well, let me ask you. So you met with Gene, and so, for example, I've obviously never been on the inner workings, but as I interviewed some main get men and associates, what I thought how things were and how things actually were, or at least their interpretation was much different. What yeah. are some of the things you learned about from the life from Brain Gene's book? Well, we used to meet every Thursday in, in, at Sophia's, uh, at Sophia's restaurant in Englewood, because he lived in Beautiful. Queens at the time, and I yeah. live in Jersey. I don't want to drive all the way to freaking yeah. Brooklyn. So um, we met uh, at Sophia's restaurant every Thursday. I bought lunch, nice. and he just he did two hours of Gene. Uh, what do you uh, What do you keep in your box there, cigar wise? Uh, probably. Well, I do have some Monte. I have some Cubans. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, Monty Twos? Monty Twos. That's my favorite. Yeah. I also like the Trinidad uh, Cubans. <laughs> You're talking dirty now, Lewis. I yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like those. I get I get four boxes a month, so I you know I give them out. My son gives them out, um, yeah. and we have a good time with them. I also like I also like the Tatuaya, the, the, the new ones. Those are nice. Yeah, yeah those are nice. Yeah, I, those I are respect. nice. Yeah and, yeah, and the Monte Cristo the Dominicans, you know, I, I, yeah. I don't stick with one cigar. Yeah, I could I could tell you I'm not crazy about the um, the Gurkhas. Like, I don't like those for some reason, but I don't know so why. So I have a love-hate relationship with Gurkha. So there was a cigar place that I went to. You know how it is. You go to a cigar place, and by me is actually a Drew Estates lounge. Oh, so they're nice people. Like, I met them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, a Jewish guy from Brooklyn. Uh, to this yeah. day, I still think he's involved with the company. Friedman and, or something. Yeah. Yeah, free. Yeah, that's it. And um, and uh, obviously they're heavy Drew Estates. Um, so you get like the T fifty twos. You get the Liga yeah. nines. Um, the whole Liga's a good together. cigar. Liga's a good cigar. Oh, Liga's uh, T fifty two is my all time favorite. But right. Liga nine, Liga nine. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna do a review. We're still review together on it because uh, I I think I'm gonna. That might be a close number too. So I'm heavy on Drew Estates as a result, but my old cigar place in um in uh, uh was it Rutherford, Rutherford, New Jersey, um was big on uh whoever distributes Gurkha. So I really oh you mean you mean you mean Lynnhurst? Lynnhurst, yeah, Cigar Emporium. Yeah, Richie, Richie, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, you know Richie? Yeah. You want to hear something crazy? I was going to Richie for like a year, and he, you know he's kind of a dick, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And all of a sudden, we started talking. He knew my sister and has been to my house when I was a kid. Oh, no kidding. I was fucking follow. Like, no, my sister were like, well, from Rutgers, Newark. And to the yeah, point, yeah. I like, was at my home when I was a kid. I probably tugged that in shorts. So oh, then he was like, a, little nicer, a little nicer to me. But he was a heavier Gurkha shop. So I really love Gurkha. My only challenge is because I'm a marketer that right. I feel like you overpay for them because they're a marketing company. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. Really not gonna. Good cigars, and they source from good areas. But I don't like that they're not. They don't have the love. They're not packing them. They're not making them. Like you know, you can say what you want about a Fuentes, but you 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 know you're smoking a Fuentes. You know. Do, do you know? Do you know? Have you met one? Do you know Nick Nick Pradermo? I I've seen him online. Never met him. The guy, the guy is. You got to meet this guy. You got to interview him. He's a oh. great interview. He's a fabulous guy. Um, and I had the I had the honor of uh, talking to him for an hour one time at J and R Cigars. Oh and wow! Times. And he and I sat down. We really hit it off. Um, and his cigars are good, uh, but his story is better. He um, he um, he has a, he's on YouTube, I believe, right? I don't Perdomo? know. I don't know. I think it's a channel, or at least had a channel like Trader of Light and stuff. And I had a Perdomo recently. And um, they're kind of a gold uh, label. Yeah, gold. that's the an the anniversario. Yeah, that's there's the ten and the twenty, right? Exquisite smoke. It, it was yeah. like it was like an eight eight. It was a beautiful smoke. Absolutely, beautiful. absolutely. And his uh, his story is, uh, as a Cuban uh, immigrant, his father was. Can you uh, give us a yeah? Give us a skinny on it because we're, well, we're gonna, <laughs> very we're gonna quickly. His it. his father his father came here from Cuba. His, his tobacco farm was taken by Castro. Uh, his father wound up uh, washing Volkswagens for a living. And Nick went to college and he went to uh, air traffic control school. He wanted to open up his own firm. Yeah. Uh, his father told him not to. He started in his garage. Uh, I'm giving you the, the, the Reader's Digest version. He started in his garage. Uh, and the year I met him was like three years ago. He sold 21 million cigars. 
Wow. So there's a marketer for you. There's a guy, and his story is terrific. Uh, he's got 4,000 rollers in Nicaragua. Wow. So there's a guy who's done a really big job for himself and his family. You know what you said? And, and the etymology and the etymology of his of his uh, of his family is Italian, by the way. Yeah, I was gonna say because that's it. It sounds like an Italian name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I got a. Uh, I got the net now. Now I got I'm on. Um, I uh, you know smoke with quite a bit. I developed a good rapport. Senator Menendez used to go to. Richie oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. I was with uh, his associates last night there. Uh, yeah. Virgil and uh, and, yeah, Virgil, and yeah, Virgil's a good man. Oh, he's great. I love the yeah. guy. We were together last night, and uh, and uh, and he's Ralph, Cuban as well, right? I think what's that? Virgil's Cuban too, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, they're all Cuban. He worked for Menendez for many, many years. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Bob, I, I've seen Bob at my country club a few times. He's a nice right. man, very right. nice man. Uh, and he loves cigars and yeah. other things, and he's a great guy. He's a great guy. So, uh, politically, okay. politically, I'm not. I'm not talking no, about no, I'm just, I don't uh, before we get right. like chastised. Right. Had cigars with the guy. But my brother all knows him well too, and that's so that was kind of yeah. the, the intro. Yeah. So okay, so give us your your next grandson cigar, a special anniversary cigar, a uh, so special occasion cigar. Like you're not worried about price. It's just you're gonna eat about an hour with an espresso or or your drink of choice of bourbon. And you just I have to I have to say the Opus X, the 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 oh. the, the real expensive Opus yeah. X. Yeah. Because I, you know, Fuente does a fabulous job with everything he does, but the Opus X, the the, the expensive ones, I think they're like yeah. eighty bucks a piece. Yeah, that's that's the, the, the one. Starting one's thirty five bucks. Yeah, that's the one I would go. I would go to. It's really a great smoke. I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share some uh, some knowledge with you. Um, I had an Opus X once, actually, for my buddy who just texted me. I'm doing a talk for him, and it was his birthday party. This was like twenty years ago, and he had his big money, so he rented like a whole suite in uh, Times Square, and he had a party. Yeah. And back then, you could smoke in the hotel rooms, God forbid, right? Right. He gave me an Opus X, knocked me on my ass. I, oh, I'll, absolutely. I'm, I, I, you know what? I'm going to say something. I'm a pussy. I do, <laughs> I, no, I do, I do Connecticut Shade. Um, yeah, yeah. Lighter, medium body is my most. Like a Monty 2 is yeah. right there. For me. I can't do like an LFD. No. I can't do an opus, you know. Yeah, opus, you have, to, you have to have had a meal before you smoke. Correct, right? And I'll do Maduro wrappers. You could have a Maduro, right? And it'd be light, and you could have a Connecticut, and it'd be strong. But I just stay away from strong body. I just don't have. I get like yeah. light, I get like high from it. It's insane. Oh, yeah, it knock you on your ass. Yeah, the first Cuban I ever had knocked me on my ass. Yeah, actually, now, the first Cuban I ever had, Leon Hess gave me. Oh wow! And I, I had a big. I, I sold a big deal and. Uh, we had the people up for lunch with Leon in Manhattan, and he gave me a Cuban cigar. Stupidly, I was young. I got in my car and and smoked it in my car on the way mm -hmm. home. You know, I was a oh, this is my career. I'm such a yeah. smart guy. Yeah. I I got out of the Lincoln Tunnel. I didn't know where I was. <laughs> I was out of my mind, drunk from the cigar. Yeah. Did you yeah. ever? Did you ever have a Monte Cristo A? That's like the two and a half hour smoke, the long one. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's one of my favorites. That's, uh, that's a yeah. minute. And you want to spend 50 bucks on a cigar, it's... Yeah, I don't, you know, my son buys me cigars every, a lot, but uh, at Christmas time, he's very well-to-do. He's a very successful young man. And, and, and that God bless is right. And he, um, he, uh, he's named after me. And, 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 and he buys me these uh, very expensive cigars. And I tell him, Lou, don't yeah. do that. Yeah. Because I don't need an $80 cigar. Correct, correct. You know, that's not me, man. I'm a the Bronx kid. The only cigars that I'm going to put out for on special occasions is Davidoff. Yeah, he buys me the Davidoffs. And, yeah. and, and they're, Davidoff, they come in this. Right. Yeah, look at this here. I have I, I keep the box as a momentum. I mean, this box was like $800 with cigars in it. Yeah, that, uh, and I'm like, what? I keep pictures in it. I'm like, you know, exactly I don't want it. I don't want it. I really yeah, don't. Meanwhile, want you know what I have on my desk? Fake bahikis. <laughs> so I, uh, uh, somebody gave me a box of them, and I knew they were fake, and I tried to be polite. And then, like, I saw them get in an event and gave me another box, and they were fake. It's just a shame. Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, the old Italian guys used to drink, smoke the Denobili cigars. Yeah, with coffee. With the coffee, right? And yeah. then when, when the cigar was down to this big, they would put it in their pipe and smoke the rest of the oh. tobacco. So, you know, I'm a little bit bit accused like that. I don't want to spend 80 bucks for a cigar. Yeah. Uh, 8 to 10 to 15, that's my limit. Yeah. How, uh, about, even though uh, I, 
How about yeah. uh, if you're gonna smoke one cigar for the rest of your life, your daily cigar on the golf course after a long day, just one cigar, but it's gonna be your cigar for every day. What would it be? Probably the Monte Cristo. Okay. The yeah. Cuban or the or the uh, no, white? No, the, the white label, the white yeah. label. Yeah, that or the Padermo, uh, the Padermo Anniversario. I like him. Um, but I think I, I like the cigar more. I like I like Nick more than the cigar. He's just a very engaging guy. Um, I, I, if you if you were to do daily, I like the uh, Romeo Julieta 1875. It used to can't, be like can't beat it. Can't beat well, it for every day. Be, smoke. I don't, I'm getting old now. It used to be five dollars and fifty cents a stick. Right. And then one year became um, cigar of the year, and then it's now they're too cool for school, inflation, taxes, and it's like eight to eleven dollars a stick depending where you get it. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, which is still a great stick and it's a great cigar. It's just that it, you know, you get a, you get a, you get spoiled. You know, you buy a cigar for six bucks and now it's right. Like more, you know, right, right. I'm trying to keep it down to one a day now because I like them so much. I was doing three a day. Wow. Um, yeah, but they're not benign. Let's let's be honest with oh, you. I know. Yeah, they're not benign. You have young kids and you got a, oh, a long haul. So you got well, it. You got I'm not about lung cancer. I'm worried about mouth cancer. That's yeah, worried. throat, mouth, esophagus, yeah. that kind of shit. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm cutting back. When I play golf, I used to smoke a lot on the golf course. I'm yeah. doing less of that. Um, but I enjoy it so much. A friend of mine insists if you smoke less, you'll enjoy it more. I it's crazy. If I think of so I go extreme, right? When I used to go to Richie's, I would go every night. Right. And, they, what they do is they're open like five in the morning. They, they right. a movie at about 2 a.m., right? So yeah. I would get there about like 10, 30, 11 on my laptop, and I would have a three cigar smoke from 11 a.m. and say as late as three. Um, right. So I'm probably doing a good 20 cigars a week, which is bad. So when Not I no pulled good. back, when I pulled back, I actually felt better. Um, I could breathe better. Right. And when I reintroduced and I went to more sporadic, I enjoyed them so much more. Yeah, so exactly. Fun. Exactly. You enjoy it more, and that's the whole point of it. And the one thing that Cigar Aficionado taught me, if you yeah. light a cigar and you don't like it, if it's plugged, if it Correct. doesn't taste right, throw it out. Yeah. Get another cigar. I uh, was at the Legal Lounge, and I had the draw I didn't like. And for the first time ever, I'm like, Dave, can I swap it out? He's like, don't worry. Like, I'm, I'm oh, not that yeah. I'm but if I'm not enjoying it, if I know something's not right, now I know enough to know, which I would never. The old me would have, like, put it out and then pay for another one so it would embarrass to ask for it. But have you you're been, right. I'm a little have, more discerning now, you know. Have you been down? Have you been down to Rocky Patel's place in the in the um, uh, Naples, Florida? I haven't been, but I heard a lot about it. Oh my God, it's fabulous. Oh. He's a he, he's a good guy too. I I played golf with with him a little bit, and oh, wow. um, yeah, he's a good guy. He's he's a good guy. Very very. Uh, he gave up his whole life for the cigar industry, which is where do you, amazing. Where do you land? Where do you land on spirits and pairing? Do you like bourbons or are you a whiskey guy? I'm wine? not. I, I'm not a drinker. I'm not wine. I don't think wine goes well with cigars at all. Um, uh, hold on, you'd be surprised. I, I'm I'm finding yeah, out. I'll Pinot, try it. A Pinot Noir. Yeah. With like a kind of a nuttier flavored. Um, you know, you know what I did? I ha I'll give you specifics. I had a Decoy Pinot Noir with a, my father, and it was like oh, hand in glove. it was like hand and glove. I know. It's a, it, my father's a great smoke too. Um, yeah. I, I, I like I like bourbon and I, I like uh, yeah. McCallum Scotch. Yeah, McCallum uh, Scotch. McCallum's twelve. I'm not a big drinker, but I do yeah. enjoy it, and I'll I, I usually drink half the glass. Yeah. Uh, what, what, I don't what, like, what, what, what bourbons you like to pour? Oh Is Jesus! Uh, my friend is the. I, I have to say this because Ronnie Shalom, uh, he runs the uh, he runs Jefferson. Uh, and Ronnie's a dear, dear friend of mine, uh, and he runs them on the East Coast, and I like their Ocean, Jefferson oh, Ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, have you tried it? I heard of it, never had it, though. It's great. It's a great, great bourbon. But there's so many good bourbons. I mean, oh, yeah. the, you know, I, I can't even think of the names of them, but I do I do prefer the bourbon when I'm smoking a cigar. So, so switch Actually, when, I go, when, when, I, when I'm off this with you, I'm going to the place to have a cigar. <laughs> Beautiful. And uh, again, we'll link up soon for one and draw one together. I hope so. So one of the things in doing kind of like you're writing books like with Gene and I've interviewed Gene in the past and I've interviewed, you know, some informants. That's the only way to, um, to get information. However, you know, sometimes there's some pushback or people are questioning their validity or they may reach out to you or could be a victim. 
Have you had any pushback or any no. kind of uh, anybody reach out? No. You know, I know enough people that I know who to call. Yeah. I mean, in one of my books, Tom, I think I forgot which one it was, but it says not every Sicilian's in the mafia, but we all have a phone number. Good point. You understand? We all have a phone number. And I've had that phone number since I'm a child. Um, And I'm respected in that community. I'm respected among them. My my mob guy, I had a few very good uh, capo friends. And he said to me, Louis, you know, you you grew up in the world. You, 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 You were around everybody. Everybody likes you. Everybody respects you. You were a good writer. He goes, how come you didn't get into the life? And his name was Lou. And I said, Louis? I don't like your retirement program. <laughs> and, and he laughed like you just laughed. And he yeah. said, you know, I, I respect you, Lou. So, you know, the whole point is it's a different life, man. I'd be deader in jail. I'd be deader in jail. Yeah, good point. Good point. And you have your family. You got your friends. You got your life. Yeah. Um, I mean, I got five grandchildren. I, You know, I'm, I'm here for them. And but that, know, that's when, I, when, I, when I see you, I'll tell you about intercession yeah. and how I wrote that book not to personally kill somebody wow. and yeah oh yeah i was yeah i was a minute away from from doing it myself and i realized that that's not the way to go in life and i don't being in jail is not going to help my family yeah and um you know i i, I, I kind of look at it too holistically if i look at the top five wealthiest tiny americans that i know in my circle None, none of the five are directly related. Eh, one or two, maybe indirect. Like to be honest, Lou, the most of the guys that I know growing up that did really well for themselves had the connections and utilized it, but didn't weren't in the life. Meaning, like I knew somebody they didn't get in the life. That's I knew correct. construction that you know was right. taken care of, and he didn't have to hire union labor or somebody yeah. who got a contract for he had a little um, help. He had a little help for things here and there, you know. And I don't get me wrong, they paid the freight. Um, but again, the that's what, but that's they another but that's another area. So there's a few different reasons why I think there was a demise. One, I think lack of talent pool we talked about, right? Not recruiting the right people, not right. pivoting. But then lastly, when it stopped coming about community, right? I'm not justifying it, I'm not saying the good guys, but I would say, at least for me, and your situation is probably different. But for me, up until like mid-90s, late 90s, if you had an issue, right? As an Italian American, you were in business or you're a local guy, and you knew people, they were ready, able to help. I'm not saying you call somebody up and they beat somebody up. Right. I'm just right. saying they would intercede. Don't get me wrong. They'll give you a bill, a bill for their services. Of course. You got to the but, table. Right. But they were they were in the community. They were like kind of like a secondary police, maybe before a lawsuit. Right. Correct. Nowadays, if you go to somebody, they're going to want 50%. Like they're, they're, you're going to end up on an FBI bug, and you're going to go to jail. You know what I mean? Like, no, there's no, no percentage. Right. Because they because they they lost their utility, and you know this in business when you lose your utility, or as a writer you lose your edge, you lose everything. It's gone, you know, and that's why I think the the demise is imminent. You know? Oh no, absolutely. I think it's uh, we're past the demise point, um, and 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 I I think your your thinking is right on. Uh, there's lack of talent, lack of education. Yep. Let's say that uh, yep. you don't see the you don't see the best and the brightest of us getting into the light. That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, and um, yeah, it's, it's 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 seen its day. I was reading, um, and it's not as well known for this reason. Um, in Sicily, there's a thing called high mafia. High mafia is these are made men, but they're in the fabric of society. They're judges or lawyers or politicians. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they're they're in the, like, and Calabrian's already there with the Freemasonry. Right. The P50, uh, the, P, the P2. Um, but they're part of, like, they, like, the tax collectors were part of the... The yeah. mob. The point being is, um, you know, they understand that, right? Where the Americans, um, my, I had, a, I had a show with a former made member, and I said, "Hey, who was your local politician that you guys had on the hook?" And like, we didn't. I'm like, well, once you once you lose and you can't infiltrate politics and infiltrate the state, then you kind of lost, you know. Exactly. It's a whole different world over there in Sicily. You know that by being there. Yeah. You know, I I said I said to my cousin while I was in La Cata Frida. We were having a drink and a cigar, and I said, "What part of the island does the mob control still?" <laughs> and he and he looked he looked at me and he said, "Tutti <laughs> isola, the whole island." <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's still there. It's not as it's not. Yeah, as, but they, they got into they got into the eco mafia. They actually control all the winter. Yeah. Still now. 
absolutely. And they keep things on the DL. They're not out there with the with yeah. the with the suits and the fancy. You wouldn't even know them. Nope. And that's how it was, and that's how it should have been. Yep. Uh, I, under, uh, I, I know a lot about the Gotti family, and I've read a lot about them. I've met a few of them. I have to tell you that he was the one who destroyed the, the anonymity of the mafia. Uh, yeah, it didn't help. <laughs> it didn't help. It didn't help. It didn't help. It didn't help. Well, listen, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put a link to your site. The, the thing Thank I like you. about it is, you know, I get some people, you know, if you don't like informants, this guy wrote other books. If you want to learn about the mob, he's got some two recent mob books. He's got stuff about the Albanians. He's got stuff that are fictional. He's got some series. And uh, you know what, Lou? You're, you're pr I'm proud to be a fellow Italian American. With um, you. Great, great to meet you, Tom. Let's have that cigar soon. We will soon, my friend. Thank you so much for being on the show. Okay. And, uh, thanks again, Lou. Thank you, buddy.